So this is this is the last slide uh, we ended up with uh, last time. We were we just introduced the relativistic hydrodynamics. So in in the light of this, I'm just I'm just going through relatively quickly. Uh, so we saw that in the case of the in the description the uh, description of the hydrodynamics from a, for a relativistic fluid, essentially what concerns energy and linear momentum are just just live together within one single object, which is the so-called stress energy tensor. Uh, and so I'm not going to comment. Uh, this is the one you see here is the stress energy tensor where E is the energy density uh, in the commoving frame, so in the frame in which the, the, the fluid is at rest, and P is the pressure. Um, uh, when you move from the uh, so rest frame to a generic frame through a... Um, uh, a Lorentz transformation where capital U is the four velocity. This is the more general um, expression expression for the um, stress energy tensor, uh, in which these are just the, the time-like and space-like components of the of the four velocity. And uh, <clears throat> it's also a good, a useful exercise to see that in the non-relativistic limit, you should see that uh, the spatial part of the uh, of the stress energy tensor just becomes uh, approaches the uh, stress tensor that we already met uh, in the Newtonian hydrodynamics. Okay, this is just a more geometric definition of the same guy, so coordinate independent, while here you see the, the, the notation with the contravariant indices. And in particular, uh, if we consider the easiest case of a boost along the x-axis, so the full velocity just takes this form here, so both y and z components just uh, vanish. <clears throat> so it's just easy and it's uh, advisory to just to check this out, so to see that, so in the frame in which the fluid is moving with a, um, uh, with a Lorentz factor, gamma, so with, uh, parallel to the, uh, to the x-axis, so the stress energy tensor, uh, the coordinates, so, so the, the components of the stress energy tensor assume this, uh, this uh, part, this, this, um, this look here. So you see again that the timeline component get, gets mixed with the X, with a space, uh, with a space like component along X. Uh, in order to make sure that both energy and linear momentum are conserved, essentially what you do is just uh, calculate the so-called four divergence. So you contract uh, the index uh, uh, with, for example, the second index here. So comma nu means that you're contracting, so you're calculating the four divergence. I remind you that here we are uh, in relativity, we assume the Einstein summation convention. So it means this is a sum over nu. In particular, if we divide, so for a generic, for a fixed mu, uh, if we um, write this term, so this four divergence in a more explicit way, in particular with the time-like component zero and the space, uh, the spatial, uh, space-like components with i, index i, you immediately recognize that this is a, a time derivative so rate of change of this guy here, plus the spatial divergence. This is just nothing but the spatial divergence. So nabla dot uh, this guy here. And depending on the value of mu, when mu is zero, well, T zero zero, let's have a look here. T zero zero, if you remember, this is energy density. So you have the time derivative of energy density plus what? Well, plus the divergence of energy flux mu zero is energy flux. So this is conservation, this is the continuity equation applied to energy. And uh, while uh, if you consider if, if, M, if mu takes values from one to three, in that case you have uh, the uh, equivalent of the Euler equation in the sense that when mu is one, well, you have the linear momentum conservation along the x-axis and so when mu is two along y, when mu is three along z. So 
This four divergence is uh, equivalent to four equations, depending on the value of mu. And these four equations are nothing but energy conservation plus linear momentum conservation. So, and you immediately see that this is also Lorentz invariant because this guy is Lorentz invariant. So whenever this is satisfied in one energy, in one reference frame, uh, this is also the case for all the other inertial reference frames, which makes sense. As soon as both energy and linear momentum are conserved in one frame, this holds true for any other um, uh, inertial reference frame. So let's exploit this property. So the conservation law of both energy and momentum to see, to derive a, a property, which we will see in a moment, which is somehow equivalent to what we've seen uh, with, with some changes uh, to what we've seen in the case of Newtonian physics. In particular, let's multiply by u nu, uh, multiply I mean by contracting. So this is a, uh, this is a initially two t mu nu is a rank two tensor contracted with nu, it becomes a full vector essentially. So this is a full vector, which contracting with, you see this, I wrote it this way. So I just put, uh, new. Here I'm contracting mu. So the, the derivative is with, with respect to x mu. So this is a covariant vector with index new. And now I'm contracting it with a contravariant for uh, vector new. So this is a scalar. This is a full scalar. This is a, a sorry, a, a Lorentz invariant scalar. In particular, let's see what it is. Uh, so just, I just took the definition of stress energy tensor here, where you see, since I get the mixed, uh, uh, so one index is contravariant, one is covariant, I just adapt it as a consequence. So here, one, covar one contravariant, one covariant, and here, uh, you see, you remember when I lower the uh, metric tensor, which is flat, I just get the delta Kronecker. So that's why I have this guy here. Okay, contracting with u nu. So this is a scalar. Let's see how can, how this guy can be can also be written. Well, let's see the first term. Uh, if you look at this here, well, you can think of this guy here times this guy here. So you do, you apply just the the rules of uh, of the derivatives of a product of, the, of a product so it means that you can take this guy out of the derivation and you have u nu contracted over the u nu but this is just the Lorentz invariant quantity associated with the so the uh the uh, uh how can i say the minkowski uh, um, uh, magnitude of a four vector and this four vector is constant because it's one depending on whether this is something that I commented many times. Uh, in our case, I remind you, we define the four velocity as an adimensional, a dimensionless vector. So it's over C. So that's why uh, this guy is one, otherwise it would be just C squared. But the point is that this vector is constant. So it's um, modulus squared in the Minkowski sense is just, uh, which is an invariant quantity, of course, is just one. Minus what? Well, so plus what? Sorry, plus, well, now you, and, and the derivative of all the remaining part, which is which is, remains just within the, the derivation, and then plus the opposite. So you just take all this part out of the derivation and you derive uh, uh, u nu, okay? But again, this guy, if you look at this guy here, u nu times uh, the derivative of u nu with respect to x mu. Well, this is zero because you are, you can also think of this guy as the derivative of u nu, u nu over two, just like that. But in that case, again, you are deriving with respect to x mu something which is constant. u nu, u nu is one. So this guy here, again, is the derivative of something which is constant. So that's why it's zero. Minus, well, here I just copied this guy here, 
times this guy here. So you have delta mu nu. So this become u, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the derivative of with respect to x mu of this guy here. So it just vanishes only when uh, nu equals mu, except for the case in which the two indices are equal. So that's why uh, <clears throat> uh, here the derivative is with respect to x mu nu. So given that this term vanishes, you are left with this guy here, and this guy is one, here it is, minus this guy here. Okay, here you see the index is contracting, so I can, instead of new, I can write mu. It's the same, it's a sum. It's like changing the name of an index uh, used for a sum. It's a, a so-called muted index. And uh, now, we now, we now exploit, in a similar way as we did in the case of Newtonian physics, in, in physics, in which we exploited uh, the conservation of mass, as I was already, as I, as I already commented in the past classes, mass is no more conserved in, in relativity. But what it is conserved is the number, number of particles. In particular, <clears throat> By exploiting the constancy of the number of particles, I, I am going to show you that this is expressed by this, by imposing that this four divergence of this quantity here, which is a four vector, n u mu, well, u, capital U is again the full velocity, and n, what is n? Well, n <coughs> is the number density, so number of particles per unit volume in the moving frame. So in the frame in which, or moving or rest frame is the same. So the, fr the reference frame in which the fluid is at rest. So n is particle density. Why? One, you might wonder why is this equation, why does this equation uh, mean the conservation of number of particles? Well, let's write it explicitly. Uh, oh, by the way, I slightly changed, and this is one of the changes I made with respect to the PDF uh, that I shared. I already updated it this very morning because I realized that I could explain in more detail some concepts, and this is one of them. So let's write this this explicitly. So it means time derivative of the time-like component. So the time-like component, well, the forward velocity is just gamma, the time-like component. So n gamma, gamma n. Uh, with respect to ct, over ct, but c then will will, fan, will vanish. Plus, well, the spatial uh, divergence, so of the space of the space-like component of the four vector. The four vector is gamma beta, where beta in the sense of beta vector. So, n, uh, so gamma n v over c. So that's why over c here, over c here, just vanish. Now, if you look. This indeed, again, looks like a continuity equation where the conserved quantity is gamma n, if you look, because I have gamma n here, gamma n times v. But given that n is the, by definition, what I, based on what I just told you before, n is the number density in the commuting frame, so number of particles per unit volume in the commuting frame, when you move from the commuting frame to a generic frame, so a frame in which, for example, the fluid is moving with a Lorentz factor gamma, well, density increase, number density increased by a factor of gamma. You can imagine that, imagine a, a volume element, and imagine you see the volume element in the commuting frame of the, of the element itself, and when, and in a frame in which has a Lorentz factor gamma. What, the number of particles within that volume element, of course, is the same. What changes is the volume, and in particular, the volume gets compressed by a factor of gamma in the di along the direction of motion. So it means that the number of particles is the same. The volume shrinks by a factor of gamma, so density increases by a factor of gamma. So that's why uh, the number density increases by a factor, is in general gamma n where n is the commuting value, so the, the commuting frame value, so the number density. So indeed, in the generic frame in which the fluid is moving with a Lorentz factor gamma, the number density is gamma n, and here just this equation 
ensures that uh, <clears throat> you cannot create either create or destroy particles. The, the total, the net number of particles is the same, doesn't change. Um, so in, indeed, this this equation just, uh, which is again, look, it's Lorentz invariant because n is a is a uh, is a Lorentz invariant scalar. It is it is density, but defined in one specific reference frame. This is a four vector, and you know that the four divergence is also a, a, a Lorentz invariant. Um, operation. So again, this means that whenever the number of particles is conserved in one frame, is conserved in every other inertial reference frame. So let's exploit this guy. And in particular, how? Well, let's take the first term we have here in the previous equation that I remind you is the result of energy of linear momentum conservation, this guy here. So now, we within this, within, uh, this term, we multiply and divide by n. So you see that here I just multiply here n and here I divide it n. Otherwise, it's just the very same term here. By doing this, now you exploit the properties of derivatives of products. You, you can look at this term here to be derived as the product of this guy here times this guy here. But this guy here, when it's time to derive this guy here in particular, I remind you, this is a divergence because mu is, an, is a contracted index. You see that this guy is zero. So you have no contribution when it's time to derive this guy. You are left with the, un, with the only part in which you can take this out. And the only part that has to be derived is this guy here. So this is equivalent to this guy here. So the uh, kind of uh, particle number number of particle the flux associated with the number of particles and u is that uh, times the derivative of this guy now if we uh, uh, exploit this in particular so we multiply all this equation here in particular uh, <clears throat> uh, so in particular yes so by replacing rather than multiplying sorry we replace this guy here with this formula here. And you immediately see that then the second term is also multiplied by, is also contracted with u mu. So you can collect the term u mu because you have both here, so here and here. And here, well, this is just, the, this guy here is just copied as the first term here. And the second one, I just multiplied and divided by n, given that here I have n, here I have to divide by n in, in order to have the same here. Just like that. So this equation is energy momentum conservation with the cons where, in which I also exploited the conservation of the number of particles. Okay, so this is what I've come up with. Now, Let's remind ourselves there's some thermodynamic quantities that we defined last time. I remind you, we defined W as the enthalpy per unit mass, which was internal energy plus this ratio P over rho. But here, internal energy, you can, uh, you can think of, the, of that as Indeed, this is internal. I, I remind you, epsilon is internal energy per unit mass. So you can think of E, which is internal energy per unit volume over, well, the mass that you have in one unitary volume. So indeed, epsilon is E over rho, okay? Because E is energy density per unit volume, epsilon is energy density per unit mass. Um, so this is overall enthalpy per unit mass. Now, let's multiply enthalpy per unit mass, so W, times M, where M is the mass of one single particle. Well, if you have, so, some quantity, in this case, enthalpy per unit mass, and you multiply by, by, the, mass of, by the mass of one particle, well, what you have is the enthalpy associated to one particle. So we call this quantity uh, W prime. So W prime, by definition, is now the enthalpy instead of per unit mass per particle. 
What is the logic behind this? Well, in the Newtonian case, it was mass to be conserved. So it made sense in that context to define quantities, thermodynamic quantities per unit mass. Now you see that mass is no more conserved. So rather than considering quantities defined per unit mass, given that it's number density, which is, uh, which is conserved, so number of particles, it makes sense to define quantities, the analogous quantities per particle. And in this case, this is just obtained by, of course, multiplying the quantity originally defined by unit, per unit mass times the mass of one single particle. And so you see here, if you have the denominator is just equivalent to take rho and divided by m. So, or if you want, you can look, you can think of the mass density as the number density n times m. So by multiplying by m, it means that rho becomes n. So you see, e plus p over n is, in this case, enthalpy per particle. So the, the amount of enthalpy associated to one particle, and which is exactly if you look what shows up here. So, okay, here I just copied the very same result. Now, let's assume that uh, we consider again uh, fluids in which we can neglect the heat conduction as well as uh, this any possible dissipation process. So we can exploit the second law of thermodynamic and in particular, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, delta Q, so the heat element, you can use just the second law of thermodynamic and just express it as T dS, where dS is the, where S is the, is enthalpy, is entropy, sorry, entropy per unit mass. This one is a steel per unit mass. Now, if I multiply all these terms, by m, so the mass of one single particle, you see that here I, I have the d uh, w prime, which is already what I already commented. So the, uh, the change in enthalpy uh, per unit particle. Now, here I have the same, m times ds is ds prime, where s prime is entropy per unit particle. The very same line of reasoning. And again, the third term here, you have rho over m. You can multiply by m is equivalent to dividing the denominator by m. But this again, this is just n, number density. So we moved from here with all quantities defined per unit mass to here, all the corresponding quantities defined per particle, per unit particle, per particle. So again, yes, this is just what I just said. So S prime is, by definition, the entropy per particle. Now let's rearrange, in particular, let's express D, D S prime. So we just bring this guy and put on the other side of the equation. But you see, D, the, the, L, the, the change in the, 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 the infinitesimal change in, in W prime, well, you just uh, express as a Total differential. So this guy is just the four derivatives uh, times uh, times d x mu. Well, this is just calculus. Uh, as well as dp. dp is just the its four gradient, if you want, uh, multiplied by the uh, the, the four uh, element uh, d x mu. You can divide and multiply by CD tau, where tau is proper time, okay? So CD tau is a Lorentz invariant. So you see, I'm constantly using Lorentz invariant quantity. This is very important. But you see, you recognize this guy. DX mu over CD D tau or DS is just by definition of four velocity, four velocity. So you can look at this as this guy here, which is a four vector, in particular, this is a covariant four vector, contracting over this contravariant vector. We can do the same with the, with the uh, left hand side of this equation. Instead of ds prime, well, 
you can exploit you can express the s prime as the four gradient of s prime times dx mu again you use the same trick you multiply and divide by cd tau so you end up with u mu so this guy contracted with the four velocity now here i copied the very same equation we ended up in the previous slide so the one which comes from follows from the conservation of linear momentum and energy now if you look you see w prime is exactly this guy here minus you have here contracted with u mu well, but this is nothing but this guy here so this being zero it means automatically that this contraction here has to be zero because that's exactly the same this guy here is overall the same as here so all this guy here is exactly this guy here so if this is zero and that's exactly the statement that follows from conservation of energy and linear momentum it means that also this guy here has to be zero but this guy here is telling you that along the path followed by the fluid element s prime is conserved this is again the four divergence this is the continuity equation expressed in the relative in the, in the relativistic covariant formalism again the very same indeed if you think for a moment this is the temporal the time derivative of the time like a component plus the spatial divergence plus the divergence of the spatial component again this is the four divergence this is the continuity equation another way to look at it is just this is the relativistic version of the convective uh, derivative if you think for a moment if you, if, you, if you remember how we defined the capital d anyway the convective is just time derivative plus v scalar nabla that's exactly the four divergence. But in any case, this is telling us something. If you consider conservation of energy, linear momentum, in a fluid in which there is no irreversible processes, so no uh, dissipation, no energy dissipation, no heat conduction, no viscosity, energy conservation means automatically conservation of entropy. Entropy is constant along the line of of, of motion of the fluid but you see here the novelty is that entropy is not defined per unit mass what is conserved is entropy per unit particle so the entropy per particle is conserved which is the novelty and which mirrors the fact that as i was commenting before mass is no more conserved instead it is number of particles so here what it is conserved along the the path traveled by the fluid element is entropy per unit particle so you should recognize the symmetry of the stuff and at the same time you see the power of all these conservation laws of all these continuity laws because these are explicitly lorentz invariant so as soon as they hold true in one reference frame they automatically hold true in any other in inertial reference frames so this is also the power not only is the notation uh, more effective but it, it is also Lorentz invariant so it's a very meaningful notation now having introduced uh, the uh, hydrodynamic description uh, so the equations so in particular uh, you see conservation of energy momentum you go through the stress tensor and conservation of number of particles in a very similar way as we did for the Newtonian physics in there also we had conservation of energy Euler equation which was conservation of linear momentum and conservation of mass the continuity equation here we have the exactly the three analogs in which notably conservation of energy and momentum just get together because they be, they concern the very same object which is the stress energy tensor while in the newtonian physics linear momentum is just expressed by the stress tensor and energy is something separate 
but apart from that, now let's see what happens across in the case of a, of, a, of a discontinuity. So in the case of a shock, so now we try, we kind of uh, review the very same uh, uh, kind of physics that we studied in the case of Newtonian shocks, now in the case of relativistic shocks. So what is, again, we start with the same kinds of, with the same assumptions. So steady situations, so no explicit dependence on time of the, uh, of the thermodynamic and, and dynamic quantities that we use to describe the fluid. In this case, you can imagine instead of, uh, well, if we are considering as we will do uh, relativistic fluids at some point, uh, it is more convenient to use gamma instead of the velocity. If the, if the fluid is relativistic at some point, gamma is, the velocity is one. It doesn't tell you, close to one doesn't tell you really much. It's more meaningful to use gamma. As well as energy density, as well as uh, the number of particles. So the, the number of density. So any partial derivative with respect to time is zero. So we have no explicit dependence on time. Again, we consider the shock propagating along the x-axis. So we reduced ourselves to the 1D case, okay? So the motion just happens, occurs along the x direction. So conservation of, <clears throat> so again, as we did in the case for, in, for, for the Newtonian shocks, we call one, the region which is upstream, and two, everything which concerns the fluid, the downstream fluid, okay? So one, upstream or unperturbed fluid, two, downstream or uh, shocked fluid, post-shocked post post -shock fluid. So let's, let's see. Well, the first equation, the first of the four that we saw as a four divergence, in this case, for the very same line of reasoning that we, it was in the case of the, of the Newtonian physics, the divergence in the case of one flow of, of a flow, which is along one direction, is just, it corresponds to equating the corresponding flux term. So the flux, the energy flux is the components of the stressed energy tensor with zero as one of the two index. And in the, the other index, well, given that the only relevant direction is x, we just take x. So we impose in a very similar way as we did for in the Newtonian case, that the energy flux associated with region one upstream has to be equal with energy flux associated with the region two, conservation of energy. So the, fl the energy flow, so the amount of energy flowing per unit area, per unit time along x and which crosses the shock, so the amount of energy per unit time per unit area, which I have on one side of the shock, so on the upstream side, has to be equal to what comes into the downstream conservation of energy. Just like that. In the very same way, of course, you want to also linear momentum to be conserved. But again, that's equivalent to take the first component of, these, of the stress energy tensor as the corresponding linear momentum you want linear momentum along x to be conserved, so Tx, the first x. I wrote here x, I should have written 1, but it should be clear in a way. x is 1, y is 2, z is 3. And again, x, the second x stands for, well, the flow along the x-axis, which is the only relevant direction in this case. So again, conservation of linear momentum along x between upstream and downstream fluid implies this guy. Very same. I'm equating the corresponding flux. This is the energy flux. This is the linear momentum along x flux. So the flux of linear momentum along x. I should do the very same also for y and z, but I have, and I have in this very case I'm considering, I'm considering the flow just along x. I have no linear momentum along y and z. So that would be trivial, that would be just zero equals zero. Well, okay, fair enough. I'm not adding any, any additional information. I have no linear momentum along, along uh, y and z. And, uh, <clears throat> and the third condition, 
Well, the third condition, which is the, probably the, the most diverse with respect to the Newtonian physics, ensures not mass conservation. I don't have the same mass flow, flux, mass flux across the shock, but I have the same particle flux. So the number of particles crossing the shock per unit therapy, per unit time from upstream region to downstream region has to be conserved. So this is just number of particles which are leaving the upstream region because they are crossing the shock per unit error per unit time has to be equal to the number of particles that shows up in the downstream region per unit error per unit time, just like that. And this replaces the conservation of mass that we had in the Newtonian case. Okay. Um, so let's write, exp let's remind ourselves what I already uh, showed you and what last time I encouraged you to derive. So the, the, the stress energy tensor expressed in the moving, in the frame in which the fluid is moving, in particular is moving along the x-axis, which is exactly our case because we are, we are, now we have again two reference frames, the frame in which, for example, one of the two fluids is at rest or better, the frame in which the shock is at rest which is the one we consider, if you remember, and the other two, and, and the lab frame, the frame in which both upstream and downstream fluids are moving. Now, it's a matter just of applying the, the three equations, these three equations. So let's see, for example, let's take the first, 0x, zero 0x zero is this guy here. It means 0, 1, x is 1. So this guy here calculated it, on both sides, <coughs> sorry, on both sides of the shock has to be conserved. So it means this guy here. Gamma 2, what is gamma 2? Well, gamma 2 is the, uh, the Lorentz factor of the fluid uh, <clears throat> in the commoving frame of the shock. Well, I remind you, the way we define the stress energy tensor, E and <clears throat> e and P, e in particular, is defined in the commuting frame. So this is energy density in the commuting frame of the fluid. Here the fluid is fluid 2, downstream. So this is the energy density in the frame in which fluid 2 is at rest. Okay. Plus pressure 2, beta 2 is just the velocity of the fluid. <clears throat> Mind, the velocity of the fluid in the commuting frame of the shock. This is the reference frame in which we are applying <clears throat> this conservation law, right in the very same way as we did for, for the non-relativistic shocks. And again, gamma 1 is the Lorentz factor of, flu of the upstream fluid as measured in the commuting frame of the shock. E1 instead is energy density in the commuting frame of the fluid 1, so of the uh, of the amplitude of the upstream fluid. P1 again is the pressure in the very same in the very same commuting frame of fluid one, and B1 is the velocity of the upstream fluid with respect to the shock. I'm trying to get to go slowly just to um, to repeat things just to make sure that you understand. Let's see the second one. So this ensures conservation of energy. So energy crossing the shock <coughs> on both sides is the same. So energy is conserved, both sides of the shock. So let's see. Well, x, x is this guy here, is 1, 1. So this guy here calculated in 2 has to be equal to the corresponding one in 1. You see? You have to pay attention to the meaning of E and P, as I said. These are quantities which are meant to be rest frame. Whereas frame, depending on the fluid, is if it is fluid two, is in that in the is it it's meant it to be in the <coughs> sorry in the commuting frame of fluid two and e one p one in the commuting frame of fluid one. While gamma one and gamma two are the Lorentz factor of the corresponding fluid as measured in the commuting frame of the shock. The commuting frame of the shock is the frame in which we are imposing 
all these conservation laws. Okay, <clears throat> very very same way as we did in the case of wrong relativistic shocks. And last, conservation of number of particles. You see, why this? Well, because <clears throat> okay, U X. What is U X? Well, U X is the time like component is gamma, and the space the spatial the space like component of of the four velocity is gamma beta. But beta here is along is entirely along the x axis. That's the only direction along which the fluid is moving. So this is gamma beta. U x is gamma beta. So that's why gamma 2, beta, beta 2 in this case, and gamma 1, beta 1. So the third equation ensures that the same number of particles per unit time per unit area crossing the shock from upstream is, is the same as the one just coming out in the downstream region. So conservation of energy, linear momentum along the x, conservation of a number of particles. Now, uh, again, these are called Taub conditions. Taub after the American physicist who first derived them in the kind of, I don't know, 70 years ago, kind of more or less, probably. So in the, in the 20th century. So this is relatively recent physics. Uh, this is just, if you think for a moment, is the analogous, these are the analogous conditions as the ranking Huguenot. The very same. These conditions expressed in the commuting shock, in the commuting frame of the shock, they ensure the conservation of energy, momentum, and in this case, number of particles. In the Newtonian case, mass. But they are very, the very same. The analogous one, with some caveat that you have to, to bear in mind. In particular here, all this quality, number density, if you remember the, the, a few minutes ago, well, several minutes ago when I defined N as the number density, I said number density in the rest frame of the fluid. So if you think for a moment, all these quantities are defining the rest frame of the fluid, of each fluid, which is different because fluid too has a commuting frame which is different from with respect to uh, fluid one. So all these quantities are meant to be expressed. So they are number density, energy density, pressure in in the reference frame in which fluid one is addressed, as well as and two number density, E2 energy density, P2 pressure of the fluid two in its own commuting frame which is different from one, and which is also different from the commuting frame of the shock. So we have three reference frames. We have the reference frame of the shock in which we, are just, we obtain these conditions, the reference frame, the rest frame of the upstream fluid, which if you think for a moment, in general will be the, the, the lap frame. The lap frame is the frame in which the unperturbed fluid, so the, the fluid that, which is, still has to be shocked, uh, is at rest, so uh, is the lap frame in essential, essentially. I'm not going to prove this because it takes it takes quite some long algebra, as in the case of of uh, I don't know if any of you just carried out this exercise that the exercise I was advising you to to try to challenge yourself and derive the solutions to uh, ranking Huguenot conditions. You may, you may uh, try and challenge yourself again here. It's quite uh, some, some long algebra that you have to carry out. But here, you may come up with the solutions to top equations. And you see here, <clears throat> the solution in general should be all the quantities two as a function of all the quantities that you have one. So, the, which is exactly what we did for the ranking Huguenot solution. So to express the quantities that describe the status of the fluid of the downstream fluid as a function of the upstream fluid. Here, it's, as, I, as I show here, it's kind of different because you see that we have <clears throat> two velocities. So beta one, beta two, which I remind you are the velocities of the fluids, of the corresponding fluid in the commoving frame of the shock. So it's a relative velocity relative to the shock. <clears throat> 
And here beta r is the relative velocity between the two fluids. So the velocity you measure for one fluid when you are commuting with the other fluid. Uh, well, the absolute value, of course, this is a positive quantity. And you see that this, is, this all, the, all of them are expressed as function of the corresponding pressures and energy density. It's interesting to focus, <clears throat> my, voice, my voice is going, uh, is leaving me apparently, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's interesting to study the case of a strong shock. Strong shock means, well, that the Lorentz factor of the shock is, is high. But if you think for a moment, the Lorentz factor of the shock is essentially the very same Lorentz factor of the amplitude fluid with respect to the shock. If the amplitude fluid is the upstream fluid is still and the shock is moving with respect to it with the Lorentz factor gamma, gamma one, well, automatically, if you just uh, ride over the shock, you will see the upstream fluid coming to you with the same Lorentz factor, gamma. Since we call gamma one, gamma one is also the Lorentz factor of the shock in the lab frame, okay? So considering focusing <clears throat> on a strong shock is equivalent to focusing on the case in which gamma one is much larger than one. In that case, well, first of all, uh, in all astrophysical contexts, basically the, sp the, the sound speed, so the speed of sound, is always negligible with respect to the speed of light. So what does this mean? Well, it means that whenever you have a, a relativistic shock, it means that it is automatically supersonic, because it means that the shock is moving essentially at the speed of light, uh, with the speed which is the speed of light, which is, as I said, automatically much larger than the, the speed of sound of any fluid possible. So all this immediately tells you that the fluid, the shock is, is well, the, 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 of course, the, the, this is a shock, so it's a supersonic automatically. Second, we'll see that in this case, so in the case of a strong shock, the equation of state that describes the, the uh, shocked fluid, so the downstream fluid, the fluid is extremely hot, so hot that essentially its internal energy, E2, and its pressure, the fluid behaves, <clears throat> behaves like a, a relativistic gas, so it behaves like light. And you know very well that the equation of state in this case is just pressure equal energy density over three. Think of light. So an ultra, a, a gas which is ultra relativistic just behaves like, tends to, uh, asymptotically to behave like light. So the relation between pressure and energy density is the same as, as light. So pressure too. And mind that both quantities, pressure and energy density are in the commuting frame of fluid too, which makes sense, yes, indeed. So this is the consequence of this guy here. P1 negligible, well, it means that essentially <clears throat> in the commuting frame uh, of, of the of fluid one, so we are, uh, in this case, we assume that the energy density associated is much larger than pressure. So energy density here is the rest and the rest energy. So rho c square. So the pressure, the initial pressure of the fluid, so the fluid upstream has a pressure which is negligible with respect to the rest energy density. Okay. So we can just consider P1 as zero. And as I said, the energy density is nothing but the rest energy associated. Given that E1 is energy per unit volume, here you have number of particle per unit volume, which is N1. So all the energy in the uh, upstream fluid is essentially given by the associated rest energy associated with the number of particles. So this is just that per unit volume. 
It is possible to, to, show, to show that in this case, and I advise you to do that, again, this is an exercise of algebra, that if you start from here, assuming this, this conditions here, which holds in the case, which hold in the case of a strong shock, you can end up with this relation, which indeed now shows you, for example, here, the energy density in the downstream fluid as a function of quantities that describe the upstream fluid. And in particular, how can you do that? Well, for example, uh, you can calculate the Lorentz factor by, by definition, Lorentz factor. So gamma is one over square root of one particular gamma square is one over one minus beta square. So starting from these beta betas here, you derive the corresponding gammas and so on. Exploiting this guy here and, and these relations here, you should be able to prove these three uh, equations. Um, let's have a look at, 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 at the implications of this. Well, in particular, given that the shock is strong, you see, it means that gamma 1 is much larger than 1. So you can neglect this minus 1 and just write this way here. Uh, the shock is strong. So epsilon E2 is much larger than E1. And how do I see that? Well, you see it right from here. So given that gamma 1 is much larger than 1, it means that E2 is much larger than E1. But if you look here in this formula here, it means that in this ratio, you can neglect in both numerator and denominator the term with E1. So you have E2 over 2E2. So 1 over 2, so 9 over 8. And this is gamma squared 2. And again, here you can neglect plus 1 half, and you are left with this guy here. Here I also put, uh, I also put the number density. Well, uh, this can be derived uh, from here, the concept from this law here. If you exploit this one, it's easy to prove that, also exploiting this guy here, for example, it is, it's easy to prove that N2 is equals, apart from a square root of 8, it's N1 times gamma 1. So let's have a look at these, at what happens. In particular, let's compare. You see, you have some energy density in the upstream fluid. This is amplified by a factor of gamma square. But, well, more precisely, 2 gamma square. So you have a dramatic increase in the energy density. So it means that the energy density in the downstream fluid, the, of the downstream fluid, is much higher by a factor of gamma, 2 gamma square times the energy density. So the fluid is really, really hot. The shocked fluid, the downstream fluid, which again, from a qualitative point of view, should remind you of something that we already saw in, uh, at play in the case of Newtonian shocks. Remember, you have a bulk motion of relatively cold fluid in the upstream, and then upstream, it just slows down and it turns a lot of bulk kinetic energy into heat, so internal energy. Here, from a qualitative point of view, we have something very similar. By, a, by, by what's the amount of, of this increase? Gamma squared. So here it's essentially all rest, rest energy in the upstream fluid, which is amplified by a factor of gamma square in the internal energy of the downstream fluid. So the fluid is extremely hot. What's the velocity? What's about, what about the motion of, of the downstream fluid? Well, the motion is told you by beta or better by gamma. It's gamma. With respect to the shock gamma 2, is the Lorentz factor of the downstream fluid as measured from the shock point of view. You see, th this is interesting. Even in the case of a very strong shock, so a shock which is moving in, in the lab with a Lorentz factor very, very large, the shocked fluid has a gamma which is slightly larger than one. So it's moving relatively slowly with respect to the shock. So it means that the shock fluid is kind of following the shock itself because the relative motion between shocked fluid and shock is small. So 
the shock fluid is just kind of chasing the fluid. So it's interesting to see the situ the properties of the shocked fluid, so the, the downstream fluid, in both reference frame. In the lab frame, which is the, finally what you are what you care of, but also in the moving frame of the shock. So from the commuting frame of the shock, which is the one we are considering now in the solution, or in the top solution, you see the upstream fluid, which is cold and which is coming to you very fast. And then after, after it has crossed the shock, it doesn't move fast anymore. It is slowed down to almost to, to, to gamma, which is slightly larger than one, but it's very hot. So again, you see from a qualitative point of view, the same effect as in, in Newtonian physics. But motion turned into heat. In the, moving for, in the lab frame, you see that the shock, what is, what, what is doing the, now that the ampere tube fluid is still just moving in the, in the lab frame. You see the shock, the shock is the result of the shock on the ampere tube fluid is just to both to accelerate because before the shock before the shock uh, the fluid is just cold and addressed and after it's both moving relativistically because it's kind of following the shock so it has bulk kinetic energy but it's also hot so the energy transferred by the shock goes into two parts both bulky kinetic energy, but also internal energy, thermal energy. This is something to bear in mind. What about particle density? You, hear that, you see that the particle, apart from a factor of, of a few, close to three, square root of eight, you have an increase by a factor of gamma. And I remind you, the particle density is meant to be in the fluid commuting frame. So in the shocked frame, the number density, <clears throat> the number density, has increased by a factor of gamma. So the more relativistic the shock, and the more dense will be the shocked fluid compared with the unshocked fluid. If you think for a moment, if you look at E two energy density and N2 number density, you immediately see that one, here you have a, a gain in the energy density of gamma squared. You immediately see that of these two gamma, gamma times gamma, one of them is due to the increase of number of particles per unit volume. So the number of particles within a, a unitary volume has increased by a factor of gamma. So as a consequence, you have more particles. So you have a factor of gamma due to the increase of the number of particles. And the other gamma, where does it come from? Well, it describes the temperature, the kinetic, the random kinetic energy of particles. So you see these two gamma, where, where do they come from? One from the, you have more particles per unit volume, and they are, all these particles are hotter by a factor of gamma. So gamma times gamma, gamma squared. This is another way of, of looking at it, very useful. Okay, so here I just copied, I just copied the, the, the result I was mentioning. Uh, it's also interesting, as I said, to calculate explicitly the, the velocity of the shock fluid with respect to the shock. Just exploit the definition of Lorentz factor. So if you invert the relation between beta and gamma, you see that this is the relation. Given that gamma two, gamma two square is nine over eight, you immediately see that this guy is one third. So you see that the shocked fluid is non-relativistic with respect to the shock itself because, well, it's one over three, depends on the context. One over three, 30% 30 of, of the speed of light in some context is considered mildly relativistic. So it depends. On, but in any case, given that this is, we are talking about an ultra-relativistic shock with an arbitrarily large Lorentz factor, this is definitely non-relativistic. It's interesting to compare the velocity of the shock fluid with respect to the corresponding sound speed. What is the sound speed? Well, we are considering the shock fluid. 
So we want to calculate the speed of the sound, the speed of sound in the shocked fluid. Uh, in relativity, if you remember, in the case of adi adiabatic shock, which is the, what we are considering now, because we are conserving energy, so we are under the very same assumptions that we made last time, so no heat dissipation, radiative losses are negligible, because energy is conserved, it means that to neglect all the possible sources of dissipation of energy, as, as, uh, radiative losses is one of them, so it means that we are considering adiabatic shocks, okay. So, let's consider, in the case of an adiabatic perturbation, the sound is the speed at which this perturbation propagates. If you think the way we derived the speed of sound in the Newtonian physics, well, that's a gamma, gamma times P, where gamma in that case is the, uh, is the adiabatic index of the gas, P over rho and the square root. Well, then, where does it come from? Well, it comes from a, an adiabatic perturbation. But adiabatic perturbation means that you keep the entropy constant. Here, it is possible to show in relativity, I'm not going to show it otherwise. I'm doing, otherwise I would be doing a course in relativity. But, uh, but it is possible to show that the equivalent, the analogous one, is that the partial derivative of pressure, so the equation of state, pressure, with respect to energy density, keeping entropy, in this case, entropy as prime. Um, um, so, um, entropy per unit particle, for the very same reason I, I was mentioning at the beginning of this class. Keeping constant, that's why, that means studying the speed of sound for an adiabatic perturbation. You keep entropy constant. So that, that's the meaning of this parenthesis. As here, as a subscript means, calculate this derivative, keeping entropy per unit particle constant. But P2 is, we are in the case of a strong shock. I already told you that the result is the fluid, uh, shock fluid, which is, which is very hot. It's a relativistic fluid in the sense that it's very hot. So the equation of state resembles the equation of state of light. So just the derivative of this guy is just one third. One third means <clears throat> over square root. So C over square root of three. So this is the speed of sound in the shock fluid, in the shock fluid frame. Now, if you work out the ratio, V2, which is beta 2, essentially, one third over this guy here, you see that the corresponding Mach number, so the velocity of the shock fluid over the corresponding <coughs> speed of sound is something smaller than one. <coughs> So indeed, we get that um, even for an ultra relativistic shock, the shock fluid is always subsonic. And this should remind you, again, from a qualitative point of view, the very same result in the case of Newtonian physics. No matter, remember, no matter how fast the shock, the post shock, the shock fluid, so the downstream fluid, will be moving with respect to the shock subsonically. subsonically. Here is the same. And we also calculate, in the case of a strong shock, we calculated the Mach number. It tends to be one over square root of three, which is definitely uh, lower than one. So the takeaway messages, of course, you're not supposed to remember all these details. Uh, to be very practical, you're not supposed to be capable of demonstrating all this guy because, I, as I said, it, it takes it takes long. It does, that's not the point, the important point to, to remember. There are some dependencies, though, in the, as in the results that we've just gone through, there are some results which are really worth remembering and which I would like you to remember, which are summarized here. In particular, the energy density compared with the energy density in the upstream fluid is increased by a factor of 2 gamma squared, where gamma is the Lorentz factor of the shock in the lab frame, of course. Second point is that the number density of particle, particle number density increases by a factor of gamma when you move, when you move from upstream to downstream. And uh, as I was telling you, 
So this, the origin of this gamma square factor in the energy density, one is due to the increase of the number density, the other in the kinetic energy of the individual particles, which is increased by a factor of gamma. So you have more particles per unit volume in the downstream fluid by how much? By a factor of gamma. And each of these individual particles are hotter on average by a factor of gamma. So gamma times gamma gives you an energy density, which is gamma square times higher in the downstream fluid with respect to the upstream fluid. This is very important. Now, if you think of the uh, line of reasoning of all the aspects that we consider in the case of Newtonian shocks, so we studied first the, the laws that rule the, the hydrodynamic of fluids. We then applied them to the case of shocks, which have the discontinuity. And we saw all these beautiful things that also in the case of ideal fluid, this is a very powerful way to dissipate energy into heat. So to heat up gases, even in the absence of radiative processes, uh, uh, in the absence of um, dissipation processes whatsoever in this cause. And finally, so we derived, uh, uh, we obtained, we imposed the ranking Huguenot solutions. I'm just making a summary, just to give you the line of where following. And then we apply, we saw the, the, the result, uh, the solutions to this equation, to these equations, and we applied them to one specific case, one specific problem, which was a strong explosion in a homogeneous medium. And we obtained the so-called self-similar solutions which also are named set of Taylor solutions. Set of Taylor solutions, so cold, homogeneous medium in which you have a strong explosion, so a strong deposition, a, a deposition, a sudden deposition of a huge amount of energy in one point, and you see how this energy propagates. In the case of non relativistic shocks, now, if you think for a moment, we, what we did today so far, what we've been doing so far, is we obtained the analogous, the corresponding equations that rule the hydrodynamics of relativistic fluids, so conservation of energy, momentum, and uh, uh, particle number. We obtained, uh, we applied them to the case of a shock, of our, of our relativistic shock, and in particular, we focus on the case of a strong shock, ultra-relativistic shock. And we obtain the, the, the scalings of the relations with gamma, gamma square, about energy density, number density that I just commented. Now, the next step, which is exactly the analogous one to what we did in the case of Newtonian shocks, is let's wonder, let's see what happens when we have a cold homogeneous medium and we have a, a deposition, a sudden deposition of energy, of an amount of energy so strong, so huge, that the shock that develops as a consequence is a relativistic, in particular, is a strong, is an ultra-relativistic shock. You immediately see that in the very same way as in the, in the case of a non-relativistic shock, we made use around the shock, we made use of the ranking Huguenot solutions. Now here, across the shock, we will obtain, uh, we will exploit the Taub solutions to obtain a new self-similar solution that we see right now, which is, which is called blanford mackey solution after the, the people who first obtained it. So, you see that there is a, a perfect analogy between the two cases. So what the set of Taylor solution was in the case of a Newtonian uh, shock, which propagates as a consequence of an energy deposited suddenly in a point of this homogeneous medium, homogeneous cold medium, now we have the analogous one in the case when the energy deposit is so, is so much 
that the shock that develops is relativistic, strong, is, is all relativistic. In that case, you cannot use set of Taylor. You cannot use Newtonian dynamics. You have to use relativistic dynamics. So you have to use tab solutions across the shock and all what we, we are going to see in a moment. These are called platform and key. So the assumption, a strong explosion, which releases an amount of energy, which we call capital E, in a small region, small enough that we can approximate to a point-like uh, uh, deposition of energy. Again, in a cold medium, so it means that we can neglect the amount of internal energy of the fluid prior to be to being shocked by the shock. Okay, so the only energy density associated with the upstream fluid is the rest energy of the fluid. So rho zero c squared, the rest energy of the fluid, given that rho zero is the energy is the sorry the, the mass density of the fluid, which is constant because we are considering a homogeneous medium. So homogeneous, like imagine I, I usually imagine like a fog like a foggy day, as we had so many in the last days. So foggy, homogeneous fog, cold, nothing, boring. Then you have an explosion, strong explosion. So there's a shock which develops and shock to all, shocks all this fog, all this. So now the novelty is that we need relativity, special relativity. So in particular, we need to describe in a Lorentz invariant way what happens. Because the description has to be Lorentz invariant. So you have to make use of four vectors or quantities that for vectors, tensors, Lorentz scalar, Lorentz invariant scalar, everything which you know, uh, you know how they transform from uh, one reference frame to another initial reference frame. So <clears throat> if we call X the corresponding a uh, space-time vector which describes the position of the shock. Over the S, you see why over the X, here S as the subscript stands for shock. So the position of a shock, so it's time, space-time vector, as a function of what? Here the derivative is with respect to S. S is the invariant quantity associated. But on the other side, what describes the property of the explosion as well as the property of the medium is capital E, total energy, the medium density, rho zero, which are not full vector. So the only way we can express this quantity, which is already Lorentz invariant, and this quantity describes how the shock, the shock radius evolves with time. We would like to describe this, to constrain that, to constrain the way the shock expands. This is a Lorentz invariant quantity, and we want it to be a function of Lorentz invariant quantity. But these are not Lorentz invariant quantity. So the only way having to do with this is just, this has to be a ratio between the quantity itself, which is a full vector, over a Lorentz invariant scalar, which is S. That's the only way. There's no other way, because you need, you need, it's, it's no more the simple dimensional requirement that we exploited in the case of the set of Taylor solution. Here we want it to be a, lower, a, a, a full vector, because this guy is a full vector. This guy is a full vector. We need to have a Lorentz invariant relation. So on the, also on the right hand side of this equation, we have, must have a Lorentz invariant, so a full vector. And the only way to have a full vector with this quantity is just x mu over s, where alpha is a dimensionless constant or we don't know yet. Indeed, that's exactly uh, what, what I just told you. And, but you see, we can, to, to find alpha, we can exploit the non-relativistic limit of this guy. Well, in the non-relativistic limit, it means that essentially ds is, uh, it means that the time-like component just is much greater than the space-like component, the, space, the, 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 the spatial component. So ds is essentially CDT. And this guy is just capital RS, so the shock radius, as we did. But you know very well the non-relativistic 
analog because that's exactly the set of Taylor solution. And if you remember, the velocity of the shock in the set of Taylor solution is we, something that we obtain is 2 over 5 shock radius over time. This has to be done. So, but that means that the only way that this guy here equals this guy here in the non-relativistic limit is that alpha has to be 2 over 5. So by John, by demanding that the solution in the relativity case matches the non-relativity, the non-relativistic solution, which we know is that uh, allows you to find the value for alpha, which is constant, it doesn't depend on, on how relativistic the shock is. So, if you look at this equation now, which is uh, a lorentz mary equation, because, because this is an equality between two four vectors, now that you know alpha, well, you can, this is a very simple differential equation. So you see that the solution of this, if you think of x mu as a function of s, where s is the independent variable, you immediately see that the solution is just for kids is s to the 2, 5. If you derive the solution, you end up, uh, you gain this factor here, alpha, which is 2 over 5. Uh, in the next, in the next uh, part of this class, we are going to see, we are going to go through some mathematics. So, uh, I, I, but, but it's worth, uh, it's worthwhile once in, in your lifetime. Now, uh, you see, if I derive this quantity here, so the four vector which describes the, the space-time vector associated with the shock, with respect to the to S, so the Lorentz invariant scalar, this guy is by definition the full velocity, if you remember. The full velocity is defined this guy here, as this guy here. But along the direction of motion, this is also gamma beta. The full velocity along the direction of motion is gamma beta. So gamma beta s, here beta s, I want to say, okay, is the shock. Also gamma, gamma is the shock, is the, is the largest factor of the shock. So this guy, which is on one side is the four velocity, so I know it's gamma beta, is the derivative of this guy. So 2, 5, 2 over 5, a, where a is a generic uh, constant, and deriving, this is just 2 over 5 minus 1, so minus 3 over 5. Just calculate the derivative. The derivative, but I know that the derivative is the full velocity. And the full velocity, as I said, along the direction of propagation is just gamma beta. Just like that. So if you take this and this, and you invert this relation, and you express S as a function of the remaining quantities, so you see that uh, you 5 over 2 on the other side, Bs is Vs over C, so that the velocity of the shock over C, gamma over A minus 5 thirds. Easy. Now, let's exploit the fact that we are considering, we are interested in the case of an ultra-relativistic shock. So essentially, the shock velocity is essentially 1. So it means that all these quantities within brackets are constant. The only varying quantity is the Lorentz factor of the shock, which will be varying, of course. So in particular, if you look at the scaling between S now, we obtain the scaling between the Lorentz invariant quantity S associated with the space-time vector describing the shock evolution and its own Lorentz factor. If you calculate a differential analog equation, you see that you gain an extra, well, minus 5 over 3 becomes minus 8 over 3. Now, CDT, well, DT is a time interval in the lap frame. But if I call tau as the proper time of the shock, you remember very well the proper time when a given time, proper time interval is, is uh, increased by a factor of gamma when you move to the lab frame. So dt is gamma times d tau. So d tau, tau is the proper time of the shock. But c d tau is just the s. c d tau is just the s. But gamma, uh, sorry, ds scales as gamma minus 8 over 3. So multiplied by gamma, it means gamma minus 5 over 3. But you see, 
gamma min minus 5 over 3 d gamma is equivalent to the differential of gamma minus 2 thirds. Proportionality, of course, I don't care about the numerical coefficients. You derive this guy, of course, you get this guy here. But what this means? Well, it means that if you compare this guy here, so the time interval in the lab frame and the corresponding change in the bulk Lorentz factor, in the Lorentz factor of the shock, it means that the two guys are proportional. T scales as, you just calculate the integral, <laughs> you integrate the two, and of course you end up with a proportionality between these two guys. Why is this useful? Because this is telling you how the Lorentz factor of the shock evolves, depends on time. It is exactly what we want. If you remember, in the case of Newtonian physics, we wanted to know the position of the shock as a function of time. Okay. Here we see the scaling. Well, the position, the position at, at, at the lowest uh, order, of course, is c time t, because the shock is ultra relativistic. So it's moving, it's moving at the speed of light. So its position will be c t at a given, a given t. But what is interesting for us? What is describing the motion of the shock as a function of time is not rather is not really the velocity. If it keeps being an ultra relativistic shock, of course the velocity will keep being close to one, close to c, speed of light. What instead is more meaningful is the evolution of the Lorentz factor. That is what is telling us how the shock is losing energy. And that's exactly what the relation we were looking for. Because now, if you bring this on the other side, it means, well, this product is constant. So in particular, gamma scales as, as t uh, to minus 3 over 2. So you clearly see that gamma decreases with time. And that's indeed what you should expect. Because as the shock sweeps up more and more medium, of course, more or the same amount of energy is gradually transferred to correspondingly increasing amount of mass. So that means that the shock has to slow down. And you see now, and so from a qualitative point of view, it's obvious, it has to be expected that the shock, so the Lorentz factor decreases with time. But the power of what we just obtained is that you know now by how much with this temporal dependence. Well, T is the time is time as measured in the lab frame, okay, which is what you care about. Now that you know the temporal evolution of the Lorentz factor, well, you can calculate also in a more detailed way the position of the shock as a function of time. This is something that also uh, a student of the first year can write. So the position of something which is moving with the velocity Vs, just integrate the velocity in time and you get the position. Now, the... <clears throat> The velocity of the shock, yes, is close to one, but you know also, as a function of gamma, how gamma scales with time. So let's try to exploit this temporal behavior of gamma. In particular, given that gamma is much larger than one, you can tailor expand the square root, and you see that this is uh, uh, one minus one over two in gamma square, something that we used so many times. So Taylor expansion. Now, gamma, you see, Gamma is constant over t cube. Gamma square is constant over t cube. Here, gamma square is the denominator. So this guy here is scales as t cube. You see? But now, the first guy, well, integral of 1 is just t, so ct. So the first term, ct, you see, is exactly, is exactly what I was telling you. ct is the first term which is telling you, well, the shock is moving at the speed of light, close to the speed of light, so the, at the, the roughest approximation, the position of the shock will be C times T, obvious. What we now want to know is uh, the second correction, which is uh, accessible thanks to the knowledge that we acquired about the temporal evolution of the Lorentz factor. Now, we know that gamma square scales as 1 over the T cube, so this is integral of T cube, T cube over 2. The integral of t cubed over 2 is t to the 4th over 8. Really for kids. 
the t fourth over eight, you can see as t cubed times t over eight. The t cube is one over gamma square. So this is t over eight gamma square. Easy. So you see now the how much the shock is left behind light. The CT is light, and the shock, of course, is slightly behind. By how much? By this quantity here. Now, this is all about the shock. So how the shock expands. But what we want to calculate is energy density, number density, and the velocity of the fluid at any point within the shock. Exactly the same task that we had to, to face in the case of the set of, uh, the set of Taylor solution. So we now exploit the very same trick by exploiting the Taub solutions in the very same way that in the case of set of Taylor, we exploited across the uh, across the shock the ranking Huguenot solutions. Now, if you remember what we saw today, is that energy density in the downstream fluid is two gamma square times the energy density in the upstream fluid. So, let's have a look here at the first equation. The first equation tells us the energy density at the generic time t, at the generic position r, as a function of what? As a function of the solution of the Taub solutions, which if you remember, the downstream fluid, the energy density is two gamma square times the energy density E1, where E1 is the energy density of the amplitude fluid. Times what? Times a dimensionless function, which we call R1, which has to be one when you are right on the shock just very close to the shock, downstream, but right behind the shock. And R1 is our unknown function, as a function of Xi. What is Xi? Well, Xi is the analogous dimensionless quantity that we need to use to describe the self-similar solution. So let's have a look at the second function. Here the second function is gamma, again, in the Newtonian physics, we, we had the velocity v, but the last here doesn't make, make really sense. It's close to c. It's not very informative. It's better to use gamma. So gamma, again, we exploit the solution, the Taub solution. One half gamma squared. So this would be what we called at the time gamma two squared is this guy here. Well, to be precise, this is relative Gamma two is what is the Lorentz the gamma two of the Taub solution is the Lorentz factor with respect to the shock. Here we want to the with respect to the amper tube fluid. So what in the Taub solution we call gamma r, the relative Lorentz factor. So of the shock fluid with respect to the amper tube fluid, which in this case is the lap frame. So this is the gamma square over to solution for the relative Lorentz factor of the Taub solution. And again, the number density downstream, right behind the shock. Again, you see, I'm exploiting again the solution of the Taub, with the Taub conditions. So square root of eight, gamma times number density in the amplitude fluid. And R2, R3 <coughs> are all are dimensionless functions which have to be one right behind the shock. The very same way as we did for the set of Taylor solution. Now here things are more, complica more complicated just because of, of relativity. So Xi now, you have, to be, you have to pay attention to how to define Xi. Well, okay, this is just zero. Why zero? Because you see, but zero, it, this should be they should be one when, I, when I'm close to the shock. Yes, because here zero is the distance from the shock. Why this? Because the 
dimension to the <coughs> quantity that we consider has to be expressed in the shock frame. So in the shock frame, it's it, it, it is you have to use a quantity which describes the distance from the shock itself. So xi is defined as x x prime, where x prime is the radial distance from the shock within towards the, the site of the explosion. So within the fireball. X prime over S <clears throat> because you need a, a, a dimensionless quantity. So xi zero, it means that you are attached to the shock. Where when uh, when uh, xi x, x prime is R of the shock, it means that you are considering right the point of the explosion. Now, you see, x prime is the distance from the shock of a generic point in the moving frame of the shock. So whenever you have a frame which is moving with respect to the lab frame, in the case of relativity, you have to pay the bill of some Lorentz factors. And indeed, the same distance, the distance which corresponds to x prime in the lab frame is R S minor R, where R here is the distance in the lab frame of the generic point from the site of the explosion. So this guy is R S, the radius of the shock in the lab frame minus, it's just to account the fact that here the distance is measured from the shock. This Lorentz factor, it means that you are changing, you are moving from the co-moving frame this is the moving frame. So when you measure the corresponding distance in the lab frame, the moving distance is shrunk by a factor of gamma, Lorentz contraction. So Rs minus R is X prime over gamma, Lorentz contraction, because X prime is, me is measured in the moving frame of the shock. So when you want to calculate the corresponding distance, this corresponding spatial interval, corresponding distance in the lab frame, you have to take the corresponding moving frame, x prime, over gamma, Lorentz contraction, which is equivalent to, to say that x prime is this guy. So you see, whenever you deal with relativity, you have to pay attention to all this. This, is, this makes, clearly makes things more complicated. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm almost done. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, we obtained, uh, we already know uh, the scaling that I was, uh, I was telling you before. So, the position of the shock uh, and the corresponding Lorentz invariant quantity. So, the position of the shock as a function of S. So, these are two results that we already obtained uh, in the previous slide. If you combine the two, well, you see that here, for example, if you, multi if you take the second one, if you multiply by s to the third five, third over three over five, you see that you have on one side s and on, one, on the other side x mu times s to the three over five. But again, <coughs> here uh, you can exploit the fact that s to the third over five is just gamma minus one. So this is instead of s, 3 over 5 is 1 over gamma. But this guy here is the position of the shock in the lab frame, so you can write also as rs. So the uh, dimensionless quantity that you use to describe these functions here, xi, is x prime over s. But x prime is gamma, is here the denominator, is the numerator gamma, and this r, r, r capital rs minus r, over S. Why? Uh, <clears throat> because S is just taken from here. But S scales also uh, as Rs over gamma. So instead of S, Rs over gamma, so you have a gamma square. So very tricky, I know. Uh, in the ultra relativistic uh, case, so for a strong, which is a strong shock, the exact solution, which I'm not going to prove you, so this is really some, some 
can, it's not worth it. But it's easy, it's important to understand that the line of reasoning which, are, which we are following, you define a new dimensional length quantity, which we call chi, define, this, this is just the main definition, one plus a times psi. And once you define this new variable, you see that there are, I'm not gonna prove it, just take it as it is. This is part of the blunt form, a key solution. The three functions that are your unknowns, R1, R2, R3, which again describe uh, energy density, Lorentz factor of the fluid, number of density at any point, at any time within the variable, are power of functions of this quantity chi. I just tell you the end of the story. So in the end, we assume we cut, now we know all the fluid at any point, at any time, we know the energy density, we know the Lorentz factor, so we know that how fast the fluid is moving, and we know the number of density. We know everything about in any point in space. So we know energy associated with it. We, we can calculate the total energy within the fireball. Well, this is just a matter of taking the energy density associated with the stress energy tensor. So the T0,0 component, which I remind you is gamma square E plus blah, blah, blah. Now, this is concerned the downstream fluid because we are just integrating. We just want, we want to calculate the total energy within the fireball. So it's all shock fluid. So it means that in the case of a strong shock, the state of the equation of a state is just P equals E over three. If you replace this, uh, <clears throat> so you immediately calculate that given that it's a strong shock, so you can neglect one. This is just four over three gamma square, again, gamma square E, where E is the energy density of the amplitude fluid, so the homogeneous fluid before, prior to being shocked. You calculate, you, you integrate over the entire sphere, so you calculate, you replace this epsilon with this guy here. And it is possible to show that you end up with this guy here. You see gamma two T cube is constant. So this only apparently depends on time because this product, this is a product which is constant if you remember. And indeed the total energy has to be constant. But it's important because this allows you to invert the relation and to express gamma as a function of time and as a function of energy. This is indeed the equivalent relation, the, anal the relativistic analog of the Newtonian expression which gave us the velocity of the shock. And this holds true as long as gamma is much larger than one. The very final notation, uh, observation I want to make Look at the energy, total energy of the fireball. This is constant. You see a gamma square. Well, if you rearrange terms, uh, just ignore the, this dodgy coefficient. What is this? You have T cube, rho, C cube, you have C to the, to the fifth, uh, and you can just take the C to the C cube, T cube. C cube, T cube is the radius of the of the shock but if you consider this quantity here this is the total mass which has been swept up at time t times c square this is the total rest energy associated with the swept up gas times what times gamma square one gamma is due to the fact that all this matter, which has been shocked, is now moving with the Lorentz factor, more or less. It depends, then the Lorentz factor is different depending on the position, but overall is moving with the Lorentz factor gamma. And the second gamma is due to the fact that not only is this matter moving with the Lorentz factor gamma, but it is also hot. So the effect of the shock is gamma square, and this sometimes 
can confuse people because people just forget about the second gamma. Oh, okay, the, the matter has been shocked. How much matter do I collect? How, how much matter has been swept up? Okay, this, well, this matter here at time t. So, okay, this matter is expanding at a, 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 with a Lorentz factor which is comparable with the shock Lorentz factor, so times gamma, and oh, this is all the energy I have. No, you are forgetting this is the total kinetic, the total energy, not only kinetic, the total energy, but you are forgetting another, another factor of gamma. This gamma tells you the matter is hot, is expanding ultra relativistic, but it's also hot. That's it. Okay, these are the main references. Uh, then I, I'll, uh, I'll let you. I in the in this shocks uh, treatment, I mostly follow the the textbook by Vietri. That's why I put it first. And uh, if you want to know more about shocks in general, these are the the, the two main treaties that I, I followed. In particular, the Zeldovich Razor is the Bible of shocks. is It's a very big thick book, you can find everything. And this is the paper about the blank for McKee solution, it's a recent paper, you have the link. Okay, maybe on Wednesday I will comment of, or uh, I will make a few comments on what is to be taken, because I know that blank for McKee solution, the first time one sees it, is a little bit scary. So, any questions? Okay.